going to be talking some more about synthesis. And what I'm going to be doing in this lecture is going through a number of different Verilog statements and modules and showing you what type of circuitry would be generated. Uh, along the way, you will see some uh, guidelines on how you should be writing your RTL code because it has an effect on what exactly gets synthesized. The idea here is by looking at the circuitry that's generated, and it's going to be in, in terms of gates. Um, in the FPGA, it's not going to be implemented in gates. It's going to be uh, implemented in, in a different way. And next week, we're going to start looking at FPGA architectures. And at that time, you'll see that the circuit three that we're going to be looking at today would be implemented in a uh, different way since there aren't gates uh, available in FPGAs. So this is the type of circuitry that would be generated in an ASIC, for example. Before I talk about that, uh, I need to define a term for you. Partitioning. And this is the process of dividing a design into modules, thereby creating a design hierarchy. And as an example, and this is one of the very first things that we looked at uh, in this class, we had a counter that had four T flip-flops and each T flip-flop had a D flip-flop and an inverter. So that's a design hierarchy. So when you partition a design, what you do is you decide what are we going to put into separate modules and what is going to get instantiated into what. Um, Partitioning is a very important method of dealing with complexity. Because the last thing that you want to do is have one big monolithic uh, module that describes your entire design. It becomes difficult to manage. Uh, some of those modules cannot be reused in future designs. So there's a lot of disadvantages associated with designs that are not partitioned. Uh, here are some rules that you should look at when you partition your design. Only leaf nodes. should be gate level. If you look at this design hierarchy, uh, the leaf nodes are those nodes at the bottom of the hierarchy. There are no uh, instantiations into these particular modules. 
So these are the leaf nodes. So if I've got a hierarchy, it's only those nodes that you should consider doing a gate level of abstraction. And of course, by the time I get down here, uh, I'm dealing with very limited functionality, so that's not a big deal. There's no need necessarily to put that in uh, behavioral or data flow. Two. Critical paths should be in one module. And the definition of a critical path is the slowest combinational logic path that's between registers. in this course we're going to be talking in some depth about timing closure and we're going to be talking about timing reports that the synthesizer will generate to give you some idea of whether or not you've satisfied your user constraints on timing. Uh, it's a lot easier for the synthesizer to optimize this combination logic block in a critical path if that critical path is all contained within one uh, module. So it's easier to analyze the timing of it, and it's easier for the synthesizer to optimize that particular path. you should register the module outputs. Uh, the module outputs, uh, obviously for the leaf nodes, may be a gate level of abstraction. And so that may not be uh, possible or even practical. But on higher levels in the hierarchy, those module outputs, if possible, should be registered. And I'm going to show you an example a little bit later in this lecture how it becomes a lot easier to meet your timing requirements if you have registered outputs on your modules. Potentially shareable resources should be in one module. Uh, I'll give you an example here of what I mean by sharing. Uh, suppose we have the statement always at A or B or C or select D equals select A plus C or A plus B. Now this is an if-then-else statement, so that implies that I'm going to have some sort of multiplexer. 
So if I do not have sharing, A and B gets added, and that goes into a multiplexer. A and C would get added, and that goes into the multiplexer. And that would give you your D output. So you could, for example, uh, have these adders in separate modules, and then in another module have the multiplexer. I'm not saying that's ideal situation, but you could do that. With sharing, however, you could do the following. leads to a simpler circuit and it would make a lot more sense to put all of that into one module. So these two are functionally equivalent. Keep your modules as simple as possible. Now, uh, do not carry this to an extreme. I mean, I could partition the design down to where my leaf nodes are just single logic gates, if you want to be uh, absurd. So, you want to keep your modules as simple as possible. Um, but you don't want to overdo that because you don't want a hierarchy with too many uh, levels in it. Okay, so I'm going to now look at uh, a series of designs or uh, HDL coding and the type of uh, designs that uh, they produce. Now the designs that you're going to see, I'm making no comment, no claim that these are necessarily optimal circuits. It's more so that you get some of an idea of exactly what gets uh, produced with certain syntax. First example, is a simple uh, assignment statement. Uh, we have stat out is equal to the complement of stat in. This is a uh, continuous assignment statement. Continuous assignment statements always produce combinational logic. There's nothing sequential in it. It's just a direct translation of the Boolean expression that you have given in the continuous assignment statement. So here you can see stat in gets inverted and you get stat out. Now, of course, if I had put any pound sign delays in that continuous assignment statement, they would be ignored because the synthesizer ignores all continuous, uh, uh, I'm sorry, all pound sign delays. Next is on procedural statements. And by that I mean
blocking and non-blocking assignments. So the procedural statement uh, syntax. Can you zoom up, please? I can see it here. Yeah. I'll change it. So the syntax is always going to be some left hand side is equal to some right hand side terminated with a semicolon and you would have either the equal sign or this arrow kind of symbol here depending on whether you're using blocking or non-blocking assignments. Uh, first thing I want to do is look at a blocking assignment. And I want to make a, a comment here, even though it looks like a counter, this is not a counter circuit. So if you look at the uh, port list, there are two signals, preset and count. Uh, preset is three bits and count is four bits. And then always at any change of preset, count is equal to the preset value plus one. So effectively this circuit is just a incrementer despite the variable names that were used. It just takes whatever the input is and increments it by one. Okay, this blocking assignment produces this combination of logic circuit. And it's a little bit unfortunate the way things have been uh, laid out in this. You'll notice that preset bit number zero is the most significant bit. And on the output, zero is the least significant bit. So don't get confused there. So I, I show a uh, example here where preset has been put in. And if you look at the way this has been laid out, from top to bottom is preset bit zero, then bit two, then bit one. I have no <coughs> idea why it was drawn that way. But I show uh, an example here where if you put in three and you follow through on the logic, uh, this is the output you get. And again, there's count three, there's count two, count zero, and then count one's at the top. So if you trace through, you get zero, one, zero, and if you put it into the right format here, you see that you get a value of four out. Now, I want to um, point out something here on the circuit itself. Uh, you see that there is some circuit reference designation by each one of the gates. But here, you see a block of gates, an OR gate and a MAN gate, and it's got a label here, and up there at the top, um, you have uh, another block that's got two OR gates and a NAND gate in it. That block around those logic gates is referred to as a macro. A macro. And the label chosen here uh, kind of tells you what the function is. This OAI OR AND invert. That's where they got that particular label for. And down here, uh, you have another OR and invert. 
Now, in the component library for an ASIC, in addition to individual gates, they will take and put in there some macros as well. And these are commonly encountered logic expressions that you run into when you form Boolean expressions. The OR AND invert appears quite often. So you can wind up with a smaller area-wise um, standard cell if you put all of that into a macro rather than leave it as separate games. Yeah. So would a macro, I guess, be implemented as a module? Uh, no. Well, <clears throat> let's back up. Gate primitives are effectively at gate level, or, or at the module level. So a macro would as well. Okay, yeah. So is that PG implement that as an AOI 22 at the transistor level, or would it just do that? From the standpoint of the ASIC, it would, because uh, that particular macro, uh, when it's actually converted into silicon, uh, occupies less area than if I chose two um, independent OR gates and an AND gate. So they just take common, commonly used Boolean expressions, put those into a macro so that you can consume less area on the silicon. So it's just for, I, functionally it has no difference, it's just it's more efficient when it comes to actually laying out the silicon because you're going to consume less area. Yeah. Do the 2-2 two two and the 2-1, do those refer to the, the inputs, or are those just part numbers? <clears throat> what am I looking at? For the OAI 2-2, two two, it, yeah. it has two. Oh, they label the inputs on the gates? Is, is that what that's referring to? Because the 2-2 two two has two, two, um, no, two uh, inputs. Okay. Usually this is just arbitrary. Okay. Um, in a lot of designs that I've worked on in, in past years, the standard convention is you use U for a device as a circuit reference designator. So you'd have U1, U2, U3, and so on. But it's kind of arbitrary how you assign those. As long as it has a unique label uh, for the circuit reference designator, that's all you need. Okay. So, so the fact that this is OAI22, I'm not sure the 22 necessarily has some significance. Maybe it does. but. Okay, so next, let's look at a non-blocking assignment. <clears throat> so here I've got uh, two four-bit inputs, reg A and mask. Uh, and a 4-bit output, reg B, and always if the reg A or the mask changes, then reg B is equal to the AND of reg A and mask. And you can see that's a non-blocking sign. And there is the circuit. Uh, first of all, you'll notice this is a bitwise AND function, and so each pair of bits is treated independently, and that's why you have four gates. And you'll notice that each gate is taking a pair of the bits from reg A uh, and reg B and ANDing them together. So the blocking assignment gave me a combinational logic circuit. The non-blocking assignment gave me a combinational logic circuit. Okay, so what's the difference? Well, here is the guideline, and I'm just going to make this statement now, and I will discuss why uh, shortly.
blocking assignments. You want to use those if what you are implementing you anticipate is going to be synthesized strictly in combinational logic. assignments if what you anticipate you're going to be building uh, will be a sequential design. There's going to be some clock involved in the design of that particular circuit. So what about the target? the left-hand side of uh, some particular expression. Well, it turns out that procedural um, assignments can be synthesized in various ways. into a wire, into a latch, or into a register. And which type of synthesis you wind up with, either driving a, a wire, a net variable, a latch, or a register, depends on context. Okay, so let's look at uh, some examples. If I go back to this example here, uh, this was for the non-blocking assignment, and we see that there is no clock involved here, it's just if either of the inputs change, uh, and I did a non-blocking assignment, and I wound up getting four AND gates to implement that function. So what if I added one more signal to the port list clock, and then I change this to positive edge of the clock, and now I do reg A and mask. This assignment is still the same. It's still a non-blocking assignment. It hasn't changed from the previous example. It's just now I have to get through a clock signal before I can get to the assignment. Well, in that particular case, I get the same circuitry as before, four AND gates to do the bitwise AND, but you notice now that there are four registers. So when this gets synthesized, the synthesizer is going to add a register to the output of each AND gate, and they're all driven by the same clock signal. Instead of that uh, 
register the module or output whenever possible. So is it you usually want to register, need to register for the non-blocking? Well, in this particular module case, the output of those AND gates was the output of the module. So I would want to register the, uh, the output of the module, so I would have a clock as one of the incoming signals. And by writing the code the way I did with that always statement and just having the clock in there as the event, uh, I will tell the synthesizer I want the output registered. When I say that you want to register the outputs, that implies that you've got a clock coming into that module and that you're going to have a always at cause edge clock, negative edge clock, or whatever, somewhere in the module uh, where it, you're defining the outputs. Uh, I've stated this before, uh, in a module, you should not mix common, uh, blocking and non-blocking assignments, whichever you choose, stick with that all the way through. 